I'm Lauren Clare, Demand Generation Specialist at Smashfly, and I'll be your host today. We have tons of great content coming up, but before we jump in, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You have two options for connecting to the webinar audio. You can either connect to the broadcast using your computer speakers, or you can connect via phone. The dial-in information is available in the WebEx panel under Quick Start. If you experience any dif technical difficulties with WebEx today, please contact WebEx support at 866-229-3239. I'll type this phone number into the chat panel for your reference during the webinar. After the presentation, you'll have the chance to ask Catherine, Tracy, and Will your most burning recruiting and talent acquisition questions. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar via the WebEx questions pane. And we'll also be sending both the recording of today's webinar and the slides via email after the event. Now I'd like to introduce you to our awesome speakers today. First, we have Catherine Minshew from The Muse. Catherine is the CEO and founder of The Muse, a career platform used by over 50 million millennials and digital technical candidates to advance their careers. As Wall Street Journal and HBR contributor, Catherine has spoken at MIT and Harvard and has appeared on Today and CNN. Catherine has been named into Inc's 35 Under 35 and Forbes 30 Under 30 in media. A Duke alum, Catherine worked with the Clinton Health Access Initiative in Rwanda before founding The Muse and was previously at McKinsey & Company. We also have Tracy Parsons from Smashfly. Tracy is the director of Smashfly's recruitment marketing practice designed to help customers change their recruiting focus to how they interact with talent and measure outcomes at every step of the candidate journey. Tracy has extensive experience in client strategy, digital development, thought leadership development, brand development, and consulting at companies like TMP Worldwide and her own consultancy, Parsons Strategic Consulting. And last but not least, we have Will Staney from Proactive Talent Strategies. Will is the founder of Proactive Talent Strategies, LLC, a modern talent strategy consulting company focused on the recruiting strategy, employer branding, and recruitment marketing. He is the former head of global talent acquisition at rapidly grown startups Twilio and Glassdoor. Prior to that, he held recruiting leadership roles at enterprise software leaders, VMware, Success Factors, and SAP. And now, I'll pass this off to Catherine to get us started. Catherine? Great. Well, I'm so excited to be here today. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and uh, Tracy and Will, I think we're going to have an amazing uh, couple minutes ahead of us. So to quickly run through what we're going to do, I wanted to talk through uh, some of my thoughts and some of the things that I've seen at the news on the art of career sites. Um, and uh, Will and Tracy are both going to chime in as they both have a tremendous amount of experience and expertise in this area. Um, and then we're going to dig a little bit into the science and then leave time for everyone to ask questions. Um, so without further ado, uh, I will go ahead and, and jump in now. So talking a little bit about the art of career sites, um, I wanted to cover three things. The first is a couple of the key lessons that I've learned in the last four and a half years at the news on how companies can most effectively brand themselves as an employer, what are some of the critical mistakes that are made. Um, I'll walk through a couple of examples of career pages we love that really work to convert candidates. And then finally, bring it back to the candidate experience, which I think is one of the most important parts of this entire process. Um, so to really start with, how companies brand themselves as employer. I thought I'd kick it off actually with a, a, a silly game that um, I happen to love, and it's called Can You Tell the Difference? So these are three company descriptions. I pulled them from three career sites. Um, and I wanted to know if anyone can identify the companies. Uh, I'll go ahead and put the logos up here. We've got Dell, HP, and Intel. And what I think is so interesting about this is that all three of these are very different, very unique companies. And yet, their descriptions sound, in some ways, almost interchangeable. I think it really um, is a missed opportunity, in some cases, to put a stake in the ground around their employer brand. And so that leads me to the question of employer brand and, and what is branding. Um, ultimately, I like to define branding, and particularly employer brand, as a promise to your customer or a promise to the candidate. Um, there are a number of companies which we recognize instantly by their great brands. These brands are sort of burned in, into your brain. And the brand can be aspirational, but it does have to be authentic to who you are and to the employees that you want to attract. Because as I think all of us know, if you attract the people that aren't right for your company or that are attracted to uh, an inauthentic employer brand, you're just going to have retention problems later. So the first lesson, I think, is uh, common mistake number one, which is don't try to be everything to everyone. 
Um, I often see companies that uh, are trying so hard to not miss a single possible person, but they end up sometimes sounding generic. You know, you've all seen these. There's other companies that say, we are an inspiring place to work, full of team players. Like, that's great, but you know, what, what else is it that makes you special? Um, and so Tracy, and I know when we were chatting about this before that you all both had some really interesting comments about this idea of um, I'm not trying to be everything to everyone and instead really honing in on what makes you as a company special. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, 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 what's, what's specifically uh, interesting about this part is when they try to be everything to everyone, it actually creates inefficiencies in the hiring process because then they start attracting, uh, you know, a, a very broad uh, amount of people that many of which may not be qualified for the roles, right? But when you get really specific about who you are as a company, very specific about your culture and the type of people that are successful there, um, they start to self-select, right, based on that content. They may go, oh, you know what, it's a cool company, but probably not the culture for me. And then they don't apply. So sometimes the the result that you want out of a great branded uh, career site, employer brand, is to actually lower the amount of candidates coming in, and so in, thus increasing the quality of the, the ones that do. Yeah, I couldn't agree with Will and Catherine more. This is Tracy, and one of the things that I advocate very strongly is that you have to, have to, have to, have to give people an opportunity to screen themselves in and screen themselves out. And your career <laughs> site should be that place in which you are helping them make that decision. So if you try to be broadly appealing to everyone, you're going to appeal to everyone when in, uh, ultimately they're going to end up turning over, to Catherine's point. You know, giving people the power to understand this is the right organization for me versus this isn't the right organization for me really elevates your employer brand because you're being authentic, you're being honest, and you're telling them the real story of what it's going to take. I mean, we're asking people to invest a tremendous amount of their time in your company and in your company's mission. Um, you want to make sure it's the right investment that they're making. Absolutely. And I think that's, um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people think about an employer brand as just coming from one channel, just coming from a career stage. But in reality, I believe there's so many more elements of employer branding, which is both so many more opportunities to attract the right people and turn away people that aren't going to be a right fit, um, but also it is a lot of things to think about. And so on the slide here, I've got a couple examples. Um, Obviously, if you are a business that has an existing consumer or B2B brand, that brand is going to inform your employer brand in ways both potentially good and bad. Um, the first time you reach out to a candidate, whether it's sending them an email, whether it's them seeing a job posting, that first touch experience is a big part of how people will think of your employer brand. Um, the interview process, the people on your team that they meet, the questions that they're asked, that will inform their opinion of their employer brand. Uh, anything they see across the web, anything they hear from your employees, anything they see on your social channels, and then of course your career site and other resources that you're actively putting out there and you're actively controlling. And I think that when you think about your employer brand consistently, you can make sure that these are consistent and on message. Um, but that leads to one of the second most common mistakes that, um, that we see pretty frequently at the news, and that is companies confusing culture with perks. Uh, I think it's really important as a business to know that you are not your perks. And you know, when you think about what would attract you to work for a company, um, having you know uh, a football table or even great health, those are all things that are incredibly important, but people are also looking to understand how people interact, how decisions get made, what sort of challenging problems you work on. And I know that, um, that uh, Will and Tracy, you all probably have seen a number of funny examples here, but it's it just is one of those recurring things that, that seems to never go away. Oh yeah, I, you know, I, I, my career has been very focused in the in the tech world, both leading recruiting in small startups to working at big tech companies. And in almost all of those companies, you see a ping pong table, you know, uh, <laughs> foosball table like this photo here. Um, and what I hear commonly from candidates is, is I want to. This is Silicon Valley. Everybody has free food at the office. Everybody has ping pong tables. What is unique about you as, as, as a company? What is your mission? You know, I think this common mistake goes to a, a very central theme that a lot of companies talk about what the what of who they are as a company, what they do, what it's like to work here, and not a lot of the why. Like, why do people work there? Why are they excited mm -hmm. about the, the, what is the mission, the problem you're solving for the world? And when you can represent that in your career site and a multi-channel multi 
marketing strategy, that's when you start to win. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's not, and you have to respect the fact that, I mean, like Smashlight, we have a lot of remote employees, and despite the fact that I have a pinball machine in my house, doesn't make my house the great place to work. What makes the great place to work is the people that I work with and the, and the things that we enjoy, and it really is about impact. You know, what kind of impact you're going to have at that company, because today's modern candidate really cares about what they're going to impact. Again, they're investing a lot of time. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, it, it can be difficult sometimes to infuse um, all of your outreach with the sense of impact, purpose, of challenging work. But um, one term that I found very helpful that rolls with all of these things is the idea of an EDP, or an employee value proposition. It's your specific unique set of offerings, values, associations that would help someone understand why you, why this job, why this company. Um, and I think that it's, it's something that is really powerful, and the more you clearly define your EVP, the, the more effectively you're going to be able to almost send out a sonar call attracting the right people to your brand, and, and as Will, you said before, someone kind of turning away those people that probably wouldn't be a good fit. And I think the heart of this, in many cases, comes down to your career page and your ability to really tell your story there. So going into a few examples of career sites, because this is obviously the first chance you have to really uh, get in front of a lot of candidates, I wanted to start by um, an example that the company that many people are familiar with here, and that's Google. Now Google could highlight all sorts of perks on their career page. They could talk about you know, their gourmet meal. They could talk about massages. In fact, I once had an executive from uh, another company come to me and say, oh, we can't compete with Google. They have a slide. If you think a slide is why people are choosing Google over your company, in some cases I think you've already lost. There's so many other elements on which companies can compete for talent, and I think it really is, um, I think it really says something that Google puts front and center this idea of doing cool things that matter. Uh, that's their EVP, their employee value proposition. They really focus on impact and meaningful work because it's all about um, the, the, the change that their employees are able to see in the world. Um, to give you an example of a site that I think has missed opportunity, um, it would be Vice. And Vice is a fascinating brand because they are all about targeting and reaching millennials. Uh, they have um, quite a following among a very young visual, digital demographic. And yet when it comes to their career page, there's such a missed opportunity here. If you zoom in on the section, why work for Vice? You'll see things like uh, global youth media company, industry leader, non-traditional work environment, be part of an award-winning team. Um, those things are great, they're very positive, but they don't differentiate by from so many other businesses, and I find it fascinating that there's not a single photo or video or story of an employee on this page. Um, and I think that that's really a, a missed opportunity. Um, and so kind of walking through a couple of, um, of brands that do well, and actually really, Tracy, if you want to jump in at any point, I know uh, feel free to, to chime in here as well. There's just a, almost so many um, things to be said for... <laughs> yeah. I, no, I agree. I, I think it, it's, it's, it's show, not tell. And they're not going to read bullet points on a website, right? Show them. Maybe that's a, a great video talking about about your culture, um, pictures of real, actual employees, not stock photos. Um, definitely a show, not tell. Yeah, and the only reason that, the only reason they're going to read it is if it's interesting. And when you look at the text here, it's not interesting. Anybody can hang their hat on this to what you were saying at the beginning of your talk, Catherine. It's you know you have to be differentiated and talk about what's in it for them. Exactly. So a few examples that we pulled together as a group that we thought could be really interesting. Um, Kickstarter. They have uh, a website that's, that's really focused around values and not buzzwords. They kind of put front and center the social impact element of their mission. They talk in the text about how creativity unites them. They use phrases like, we obsess over helping creators, that again are really going to resonate with a certain portion of candidates, um, and may not resonate with others, and that's all right. Um, discovery, uh, Discovery Communications, with the Discovery Channel, they have a very, very visual career site. They have videos that tell a story, they take you inside parts of their business, um, and make sure you really can kind of see elements of it, not just hear. And then uh, Spotify, I think, uh, they do a great job putting some of their employees front and center as the face of the brand. Uh, they interview people about, you know, how did you get to Spotify? What are you doing? And they actually, because they're a music company, they include some of their employees' favorite songs. And this is something that I think is, is 
we've seen over and over again on the news is that when you put your, your frontline employees, your managers, the people that are in the trenches doing the work and make them the face and the evangelist of your brand, you get some of the most authentic content. Um, and that really goes down to this last element. So it's great to communicate your values, create these visuals, not just text, and highlight your employees. But I think all of that, the most important thing is making sure that you're authentic and that you're core to who you are and that you communicate that to a candidate when they're in that early phase of just learning about you and deciding whether to fill out your application, deciding to go through possibly hours of, of, of interviews and dig in deeper, and then again, potentially deciding to spend two, three, five, ten years of their life working at your company. Yeah, that's great. I just want to comment on, on, on the use of employees and this content and how important that is because, and it's multifaceted. It doesn't always, a, having employees get involved and telling them uh, is actually at the same time that you're doing employer branding, you're also doing employee engagement. In fact, you can start mm -hmm. projects like this when you're creating your EVP, when you're creating content for the cruise site. Start them as employee engagement campaigns of getting the employees excited around the culture, and then the byproduct of that is great employer branding content. And so these things weave together really well when you're starting to build out a strategy for your career site. Well, I'll never lose light of the fact that people believe people, they don't believe brands. And so the and best, <laughs> you're right, so the best thing that you can, I think it was like 80% of people don't believe brands that they believe people, and I, I'm pulling that out of the thin air, but I can dig it up if needed. It, it, it's true. Um, candidates want to know from other humans. They want to know from other people what it's like to work there and what difference they've made um, at the company and what difference the company is making for them. They always believe people, but they very rarely believe brands, and the great thing about employee value propositions is it's about the people. Um, so leverage the people. They're they're there because they're and they're your greatest advocates. To Will's point, then it's an opportunity of amplifying that message, which we could never do. Like the companies that are worried about, you know, how could we ever beat Google? You beat Google by having an amplified message with a great army of employee ambassadors and advocates. Yeah, I get it. Your, your employees are what make you unique because you may have mm -hmm. a product that you have a lot of competitors for that product in the space, right? right. And that's fine, but what's going to differentiate you the most from your competitors is that they don't have a Tracy Parsons like Smashfly has. Yeah, or, you know, it, they're not Muse because they don't have Catherine, right? Like that, your people are what differentiate you the most. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting, I think uh, Catherine Edder had asked a question just now in the, in the chat about when it comes to show and tell, how can you effectively show impact and meaningful work? And I think to your point, it, it really boils down to the people and to the stories and to taking, not just saying uh, we do meaningful work or we tackle X, Y, Z problems, but look at one employee's experience with one problem. How have they tackled it? How has their work made a difference? And that's the connection that is going to resonate with a potential candidate in a way that almost nothing else can. So very quickly, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for the science, so I'm going to go through these very quickly. We talked a little bit about the importance of being real. Um, we talked earlier about how the most successful brands, and we see this again and again on the news, the profiles that get the most visitors, that have the most applicants, and that have the most sort of ardent followers from the news community are the ones that both attract and deter. Uh, this is an example of a company that has, you know, maybe a very useful culture, that has dogs in the office. I've also seen companies that are incredibly hard charging, no stupid questions, go, 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 like just, you know, whatever it is that makes up the essence of who you are, I think the best companies really own that, uh, live it, breathe it, and put it out there. Um, and, and it makes you not boring. You know, this is a company in Austin that we work with. Um, this might look like a fairly classic employee photo at first, but if you click through, they've got a Yeti in there. And I, think I love that Yeti so much, Catherine. I can't even tell you how much I love that Yeti. <laughs> Women I cannot express so my love for him. <laughs> I want to know who's under there. That's, uh, that's what I want to know. And that's actually, though, that's the perfect thing to chat about with a candidate, you know, to do... Did you see our um, photo? This is this is how we are. This is how we express some of our kind of uh, quirkiness. It's those unique traits that really make you stand out. I hope it's the and CEO. Then, uh, I, you know what? I was actually just thinking if we ever did a Yeti photo, I would definitely yeah. raise my hand to be yeah. there. Great. I would totally be the Yeti. 
Well, no, I mean, that's one of the other things that, that it has to be authentic to your side coming up. It's like it, if your company is not fun Yeti style, that's okay. Um, you know, but if your company is fun Yeti style, uh, play that up. Some companies aren't fun. That's not what makes them tick, but we have to find out what it is that makes you tick. No, absolutely. And um, another question relevant to this, Marvin asked, do you have any recommendations on a cost-effective cost source for creating videos? Um, I've got obviously lots of ideas on this. So first of all, the news creates a lot of videos for our clients. That's one of the things that we do. We've also seen companies that have videos created by employees who are creative, uh, videos created by local college students. I mean, I think that there's a lot of options, whether you go and get it, you know, top of the notch professionally done, whether you work with someone like us, or whether you just have those, those resources in your own company and in your own community. You can always experiment with a short video with just an employee talking about a recent project and go from there. Great tip. Great. And then finally, um, I feel like we're actually, yeah, uh, we, <laughs> our conversation has been so far ahead of this, but exactly, Tracy, as you said, people believe other people. And so if you find your employees who are advocates for your brand, who love working there, you let them speak in the language of a real human as if they were sitting across from somebody. This is, a, I think, an example of a company called Handy on the News. And it's almost as if you're sitting across from Carolyn over coffee asking, tell me about your job. You get that real human-to-human -human connection, which I think is so powerful. And ultimately, that leads to the candidate journey and to how people are finding your career site. Because I think the fascinating thing about talent acquisition today is that you're not only targeting the people who are out there looking right now, you're targeting the people who in three months, six months, two weeks might be thinking about changing careers or changing jobs. We've seen that um, over two-thirds of candidates are thinking about the job search six months prior to searching. And so in that case, it's really not just about building your employer brand for the people who have already decided to apply to you, it's kind of jumping in and figuring out how do you raise awareness whether it's putting out content, whether it's being out in the community, how to make sure people are considering you when they're researching opportunities and engaging with employers. And then once someone's at that decision point, if they're the right candidate, how do they make sure you choose you? And there's nothing wrong with getting people's attention early and getting them into your pipeline because when we talk about some of the some of the measurements and metrics that we that we're going to be looking at um, in the science piece. There's, pipelining is the future. That's where we want our candidates to be because, the, to Catherine's point, they're not ready to jump necessarily right now. Exactly. And that actually is a perfect segue um, to, uh, to Tracy, I think, what you're going to speak about because, you know, when you think about starting branding and starting the, the art of your employer brand, the art of your career page earlier, it gives you even more ammunition for that funnel. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's dig over and, and kind of talk about some of the science behind this. Awesome. I love science. I'm, I might be the big nerd on the phone. Um, uh, I don't know. You'd be fine with me. I'm the data geek. <laughs> love it. I do. I love it. And I love all of this because I've often advocated that, you know, how do you know what's working if you don't measure it? And Will, you reminded me of that great, um, that great old ad guy. Um, adage. What was it that you told me that made me just check out really hard earlier this week? Oh, yeah, there's an old saying from like the early, you know, Mad Men era, right? It was which is you know, fifty percent of our advertising works every time. We just don't know which which half. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? And so that's what I love so much about um, about really the opportunity that, you know, modern recruitment marketing delivers to us. It is that opportunity to measure. Um, it is the science behind that. Like if you think about, you know, I talk to my I talk to my family about this all the time because my parents never know what it is that I do for my living. And um, and we, we always talk about advertising and everybody understands advertising because they understand that, okay, yeah, did you see that ad on the Super Bowl? And I was like, okay, yeah, which one was your favorite? And then they'll always tell me what their one was favorite was. And I always go back to, well, do you remember who it was for? And when they just look at me with this deadpan face of, no, I have no idea who it was for, that ad failed because they can't remember who did it. So they weren't measuring that message in terms of, of, of impact. They were measuring it in terms of beauty, which is great. Beauty is important, but it has to work. It has to work. So measurement is key when it comes to career sites. So typically I always, you know, people are like, well, where do you begin? 
And for me, it's very, very simple as understanding what your key performance indicators are when it comes to a career site. Yeah, recognition and recall, Nick, you got it. Um, so what we talk about in KPIs and is those key performance indicators. And when we, when we talk about key performance indicators, what we're really thinking about is three things. What three things make up a great key performance indicator? Well, for me, the first one is that it has to be subjective. And I always use the gymnastics versus track analogy because gymnastics is really beautiful. And it's pretty subjective because there's a scoring system, and they try to make it as scientific as possible, but it's really it's a subjective activity. So you, you watch something and you say, that was really good, versus track and field, which is really objective. Um, how fast did you run the, the 4 by 100 relay? It has to be measurable. It has to be objective, real measurements. Did you run faster than the last time you ran? If so, why? If so, why not? So you have to start looking at those really measurable, objective um, key performance indicators that are going to tell you how your career site is performing. Any, any comments, Will and Catherine, on, on the objective versus subjective? No, I agree. I, I think when, when, especially if you're, you're trying to improve your career site, like knowing the kind of content that's resonating that's actually yeah. that people are looking at. I mean, just the Google Analytics of it. You know, not even before. You know, what we'll talk about in a bit, where you're you're actually matching that that your front end talent attraction to you know to jobs and applies. But but just what are they looking on the career set the most? So you know, maybe you focus focus the whole section on you know on 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 a certain aspect of your culture, but no one even looks at that there. Maybe that's real estate that could be used for for some stuff they actually want to hear about. So just knowing what's resonating can really help you with the, the, the design and the content on your site. Exactly, it's like that idea of a, you know if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, it can you create beautiful content? But if you're not measuring it to make sure it's effective, to make sure it's getting in front of the right people, and then encouraging them to do the actions that you want, um, have you really succeeded? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So you have to have your KPIs that are objective, um, and they have to be tied to your business goals. So a lot of times I will sit with clients and we'll talk about, okay, what are your key performance indicators? And my favorite example that I always give is they, they talk about engagement. And I'm always like, okay, well, so tell me a little bit more about engagement. And they're like, well, did people look at our stuff? I'm like, okay. So engagement is definitely more um, subjective than objective. What action did you want them to take? So usually we get down to something like um, maybe cost per hire, right? Okay, so cost per hire is great. Um, cost per quality hire is better source of quality is better, but is that answering the business problem that you're trying to solve? So when you're developing a key performance indicator, you want to start with the business problem you're trying to solve. So if you have an organization that has a lot of turnover, do you care about cost per hire? Probably not as much as you should care about cost per quality, because you want quality people to come to your organization and you want them to stay. You don't want them to turn. You want to give them that opportunity to screen in and screen out. So you really, if you're looking at high turnover as a business problem, engagement shouldn't be your key performance indicator. It should be around quality. Yeah, Same thing I mean, with, and, to, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, and, and I want to say not, and especially not on the career site, right? Because career site's usually the the end of their journey. Most people go to the career site because they want to search and apply for a job. They're at that point, right? You've sold them on social media. They maybe they watch a video on the site that, that helped them. Something else brought them to the career site. Very rarely, maybe that's a Google search. And like, so if, if you think of your career site as your Amazon marketplace for your jobs, right? The product you're selling are these jobs. All the, 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 the multi-channel content strategy that you're doing is bringing them there, right? And so it, that's highly trackable. When you think of the apply as a buy click, and then you have the analytics back end and you have goals around that action of getting them the right people to apply and then you start measuring quality that's the you know that's the, where the excitement between that art of the design of your site and your marketing strategy for candidates and the science of the analytics behind and what you're measuring around business goals come together yeah it's it's really where the rubber meets the road 
um, and just start instead of start from what do we you know what do we want to measure? Start with what problem are we trying to solve? So you'll hear me say that a lot. And the last three things. So if the if the first one was that it has to be objective, not subjective. The second one has to be tied to business goals. The third one is that it has to be actionable and trendable. So if we're looking at say cost per quality as a key performance indicator or KPI, then our, our we're going to look at that over trend. And the action would be ultimately to streamline our spend or streamline our sources. If we're looking at things like pipeline health, we're going to start looking at our pre-applicant pool and how do we segment those. Catherine, do you have any ideas on KPI and that are actionable and trendable that you've seen? News users use? News yeah, users use that part. <laughs> we just call them users to make it uh, I love it. That's it so much easier. better. Straightforward. That's you know, great. it is, and it really um, it hits on that idea that they're all kind of part of the community and, and, and part of the family. So in terms of um, some of the KPIs that we see people track, so we'll have, obviously, there's um, high-level metrics such as how many people are uh, in interacting with the company's profile on the news. Are they watching certain videos? Uh, does watching certain videos make them more or less likely to apply? Because obviously that can be a really fascinating thread to follow. Um, we also sometimes drill down into the types of employees whose stories are featured on the news and see whether people are gravitating towards certain employees, whether the roles or even some of the demographics of the people featured make a difference. And then, um, and then obviously companies are looking at who comes through, what's the quality of those candidates, um, again, you know, are there, are we just as good at uh, weeding out people who aren't a good fit as we are at delivering people who understand what the company is about and the mission and who are bought in and excited um, and are going to be the type of people that are there for the long term? It's, it's spot on, Catherine. I think that's one mm -hmm. of the, if, if, you, if, if our listeners take away one thing, it's make sure that you're measuring something and that you can tie it back to quality. And I know that um, quality is a very hot button, button issue in recruitment marketing. It's, you know, how do you find those great people that are going to stay at our organization for a long period of time and really reap dividends for the company? Yeah, because imagine so what, if you took it a step further, and just to add to that, if you took it a step further, is if you're if you're actually measuring all this stuff in the front end and then even the back end of your hiring process, and then later on you go and you look in your HIRS and you look at performance, and mm -hmm. you're able to have that full on site where you know, hey, you know, when we when we attract people from you know from the Muse, you know, when they came from our job there, and and were hired. They they tend to stay at the company longer. That means we branded ourselves well. They they self selected in. You know, you can start really seeing from source apply all the way to hire of that full candidate to employee journey. And that's exciting when you're your company and you can make better data driven decisions with that. Yeah, and to even to level that up a little bit, Will, what if you found out that they stayed a long time and they were a high performer? That was constant. That were constantly driving innovation in your company, exactly. and you could go back and look at those sources, and look at those um, interactions that they had on your career site, and say, okay, we need to dial this up, and we need to dial this down. Yep, maybe that's part of the ninety-day check-in. You know, on, yeah, on a new yeah, hire. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about what we should be measuring, right? So if we've, we've got those KPIs that are that are actionable, trendable, that's my that's my new word of the day. I invented that today, trendable, and um, and tied to business goals. So what should you be measuring in a great career site? Um, the one thing, and now I'm going to put on my Smashfly hat because in addition to um, being in charge of the consulting practice at Smashfly, I also run the employer brand at Smashfly. So these are the sort of things that we're tracking on any given month. And really, to Catherine, she was teasing it. You know, we look at our funnel. Um, we look at our funnel. Absolutely. We want to look at the universe. You know, the universe of people who who out there could we be talking to? Um, and that that universe of people is is really in that awareness stage. Um, how can we make everybody aware of opportunities at our company or your company or whatever company you're trying to recruit for? Um, then it kind of goes down to another level. Um, and you've, they've heard of you now, they're going to come visit your website or visit you on Glassdoor or any of those interactions that they may have with you. That's, that's when they're visiting you is in that consideration stage. Um, ultimately, we want to start generating leads from that consideration stage, doing a great job of screening people in and screening people out. And then we want to ultimately get to applicants. And then selection and hire make a lot of sense. And then I have a lot of customers who are looking to us to talk about what's at the other end of that funnel in terms of advocacy. 
So that makes mm -hmm. a lot of that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So really, you have to start measuring the funnel. Measure the funnel. Measure your site visitors. Measure how many uh, people might have interacted with your ads or interacted with your brand outside of your site. Who's visiting your site? Did we convert them into a lead, and did we convert them into an applicant? So those are some of the things that we look at when it comes to the funnel. And Tracy, I think the reason the funnel is also so important is that it's much more, uh, it represents much more realistically the journey of a lot of candidates today versus a purely linear path. For example, it's really common for us to hear from a company that they hired somebody who originally heard about them on the news three months before. But that person wasn't ready yet to make a move. They were still in the awareness and maybe the consideration phase. But a little bit of time passed, and then either they decided they were ready to make a move, maybe they, their, their boss uh, left the company, something changed. And suddenly, they're thinking back to those companies that they've had positive mm -hmm. impressions and positive interactions with. And that's why I think a company, exactly like you were saying with this funnel, that is thinking about candidates all the way through, can really get a leg up on people who are only solely focused on applications. Yeah, and I think we have somebody, there's some folks asking, it's a pretty important question, I think, which is how how do they do this? You know, how how do they go? Like right now, they're not measuring anything. How can they get to the point where they can measure? Well, one of the things. Okay, so obviously Google Analytics, but we're, we're fortunate at Smashfly that our do, our dog food is delicious. So we can we can measure those leads and those applicants because we have a recruitment marketing platform. Um, that's something that we're using. And if you um, you know, if that's something that's interesting to you, we should definitely be, you know, having a conversation with you offline about how to execute a lot of that tracking in, inside your recruitment marketing platform. If you're not, we should have a secondary conversation of how you can leverage um, some of this in Google Analytics. Um, but really, if the, the how is around a recruitment marketing platform. Um, somebody, I think Hannity, had a question about uh, using images that are not only necessarily in the office. Um, I'll, I'll answer that, and I would love Will and um, Ch Catherine to, to chime in. Yeah. I, we're fine with that. Um, we have some non-traditional images on our career site, but it's got to be, as long as it's got to be aligned with your brand and it's an authentic moment. So we have some images that are going up on our career site in the next couple weeks of our company meeting in Florida where we're all on the beach and, and we're all having a moment. Um, we're going to have more images of some of our uh, home office workers. So we're obviously okay with that. Will and Catherine, do you have any feedback on that? Yeah, I think if it's like a company event, like you did an offsite and and it, you know something you did that makes sense. And then uh, even the outside of work, where let's say some em uh, employees are getting together outside of work because they're all friends and they hang out, maybe that's Instagram. You know, you know, there, there's a lot of other channels to show a lot of this dynamic real time content. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to all be housed on the career site. And I think that's a really important thing to remember as we're talking about the art and science of a career site is that the career site doesn't have to be where all your content lives. Like I said, it's that marketplace where you're taken. They're, they should really see your EVP, understand who you are, and everywhere there should be a call to apply to a job or join a talent yeah. community, right? But all that content doesn't have to live on the career site. It, it should live where your candidates are hanging out. Maybe they're on, on Google. Maybe they're on yeah. social media. Maybe you're really trying to, you know, build personas around the people that match your mm -hmm. culture. Find out where they hang out online and go there. Be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, to add on to the question, you know, ultimately, one way I like to phrase this, this question of, um, of how to think about the brand and the assets and the photos, et cetera, is ultimately many of the candidates looking at your Instagram, your career page, any of your um, channels or assets online is asking themselves, what would my life be like if I joined this company? And so anything that helps answer that question and that helps someone see themselves at your company and understand whether it's going to be a great fit or not, I think moves you forward. And so, you know, yes to the uh, employee gatherings out of office, um, yes to the sort of less traditional. Something that I also love is tiny details. So I think when people think about uh, images of an office, they often think, you know, standing in the middle of the office, taking a big picture. But when we send <laughs> photographers and videographers in uh, to all of the companies we work with on the news, we'll often uh, tell them, you know, go find like a small thing on someone's desk, uh, the piece of art, you know, done by an employee's kid on the wall, the, the little tiny things, the objects, the, the things that give a space of color and of personality. And that can really be a great source of content that um, helps you find those, those small things that make you special. And it's not just 
here's the cafeteria. <laughs> right. Yeah, nailed it. Funnel. Start thinking about something like a drop-off rate. So we um, we are very strong advocates of lead generation. So think of about lead generation in terms of a talent network form, something where you're gathering just a little bit of information about somebody that has visited your site and would like to learn more. And we typically put that on on the front of an application where you fill out a little bit of application. And the the, anal the analogy is that when you call support at AT and T or Verizon or whoever, you're you're going to say, oh, can we get your phone number in case we lose touch with you? That's the opportunity. So we put that lead form in front of the application, and what you want to start looking at is drop off rates. So how many people visited your site, filled out a lead form? but never converted into an application, or how many people visited your site, started an application, and never completed it. And I think the last stat I saw was about 74, 79% drop off. You can't have that. You could be capturing that person's information, so definitely be looking at your drop off rate. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll add uh, quickly to that, that we often see it's the most qualified people in some cases who drop off because they're the ones that have other options. We were working yeah. with um, a large insurance company whose name I won't say right now, but they yeah. found at one point that 92% of engineering and technical candidates were dropping off because they had a 40-minute applicant tracking system that just wasn't very um, attuned to the modern age, let's say, and they were losing all of these candidates that, um, you know, using a platform like Smashplay or, or mm -hmm. having a better process could have saved. I agree. Yeah. Sometimes that drop-off rate is a good indicator of how well your candidate experience is doing or the design of your application process exactly. Yes, it's something that we look at and, and you know, you'll find to Catherine's point and Will's point, the harder your application is to complete, the more your drop-off rate rates are going to be. And I, I encourage everybody on the phone to secret shop your applicant applications. Um, go out and fill it. How frustrated are you in the experience? Um, so that's something to look at, drop-off rates in terms of, you know, what's happening with your applicant pool. How can you capture um, that? And the third um, key performance indicator that we look at is source of quality. And source of quality is, is new, um, er, and what we've been looking at is if you take all of your media sources, and you look at what qualified candidates they're, they're sending you. And qualified candidates are going to be determined by your recruiters in the applicant tracking system, but you've got to start looking at that source against the quality and determining what percent they're driving that's quality, because this is a great conversation to have with your media partners. If you go to your media partner and say, yeah, you delivered me 2,500 candidates that were qualified, but that was only 2% of all the candidates that you drove me meaning that there were tens of thousands of people who you drove to my ATS and my talent network that didn't make our cut. Like, we, this, is not a, this is not what we need. We don't need to drink from the fire hose. We need great people. Yeah, so social quality this. is a great key performance indicator. It's like getting the power back. I remember when I first implemented my, my first recruitment marketing platform like seven years ago, and they were pretty archaic back then and didn't always have this – uh, deep of, of quality analytics, but when I would get on the phone with the vendors and I knew more about how well their products were working for me than they did, mm -hmm. it talk about being able to negotiate. I, I would say, okay, I'll do a three-month test with you guys and I'll measure and, and yeah. if, it, if it works, we'll buy more. And it, you get more of that power back uh, to those vendors and really show them that and, and gauge quality because sometimes, sometimes just how many hires you get from a source isn't always an indicator of how well that source is working for you because sometimes if your talent community grew or you had a lot of people that went through the interview process and were silver medalists that you may hire later on, sometimes that is, is, is very valuable because you're wanting to build that internal database so that later on you don't have to spend big money on a job board because you already have this database of great leads, right? So there's a lot of ways to look at it. When you can measure quality, it, it really gives you the power back. Yeah. And lastly, my favorite metric um, for career sites in general is time to find versus time to fill. And I, I love time to fill. Time to fill is very important. It's a very important um, recruiting and HR metric, understanding how long it took for an a requisition to be opened to the time that we, we got a, we got a uh, talent in that seat. That is a great recruiting metric. A recruitment marketing metric is time to find. 
how long did it take from the moment that requisition was opened up to getting the hiring manager a slate of candidates. This talks to the health of your pipeline, it talks to the health of your recruitment marketing, and it talks to the efficiency of your career site. Time to find is my holy grail. All right. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to blow through optimizing, if that's okay with Will and Catherine. I want to save time. Go for okay. it. Yep. All right. So how do you optimize, right? Well, Will kind of alluded to this. Your career site is a transaction. People are coming to your career site to transact the application of a job or the um, to drop off a subscription. They want to subscribe to learn more or they want to apply. The fundamental activity of your career site is transactional, similar to any e-commerce site. So if it's an e-commerce site, you got to think like an e-commerce site. How do we transact? What matters? Conversion. And I think there is a question in there that I will get to, the, you know, time, uh, what's a good conversion rate on applicants? Um, I, I can get to that. So when I'm looking at Smashfly last month, looking at the universe of job seekers, looking at our site visitors. So when I talk to site visitors, how, what percentage of site visitors turned into leads for Smashfly? 21%. Now, 21% lead conversion rate is insanely high. If we were talking e-commerce, it's probably 6% feels great. So a lead generation rate of 6% is solid. We were converting at 21%. So I get to go tell Mike Hennessy, hey, our stuff is working. We're converting at 21%. We have to make sure that we're tracking that and trending it over time. Um, but one of our business goals is to generate a lot of leads so that we can pipeline great talent for our positions at Smashfly. So this lead conversion rate answers our business goal of that, and it is also a key performance indicator. The fun thing that I got to report was that it was a 40% increase from January, so that's awesome. The other thing that we study in conversions for Smashfly is our applicant rate. So how many of our leads converted into applicants? And that rate was 95%, um, which is very uncommon. Like I said, if we're talking about a 74 to 79% drop-off rate from site visit to applicant, that we're converting our leads at 95% is incredibly high. So I'm going to continue to trend that over time and probably put together some research for the community to make sure that, you know, looking at benchmarks. Um, but right now our benchmark is it's a 95% completion rate. That could be looked at as good. It could be looked at as bad. Are we, is our bar too low? I mean, that's, that's one of the conversations that we have because right now applying for a position at Smashline is relatively easy. Um, but we seem to be getting great talent and driving great applicants, so we're not really concerned about it, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on. Another thing when we talk about uh, improving conversions, this is a job description that was re, um, you know, redefined. Um, when I started at Smashfly in October, the first thing that I did was absolutely gut all the job descriptions and change them. And the two things that I focused on is, one, this job description and every job description that comes into Smashfly has to read like a love letter to the right candidate. So we talk about impact. We talk about what we're looking for. And all the things that we talk about when what we're looking for relates back to them. We talk about the things that they have. It's a dis it is an exercise 100% in advertising because it's all about them. It's what's in it for them, what you're going to accomplish here. And if you have these characteristics that we're looking for, oh my goodness, get jump on board. And then the other piece is you have to make sure that you've got really great and simple calls to action. Um, calls to action improve your conversion rates instantaneously because you're telling the user what you want them to do. Another thing that matters to um, us is pipeline health. So we have to make sure that we're generating a good pipeline of candidates so that we can ultimately pull those candidates into the organization really quickly and have a very short time to find. So one of the ways that we're increasing pipeline is that we have a persistent talent network form at the bottom of our page, and I recommend this all the time when I'm consulting with clients about um, the structure of their career site. The structure of the career site, you have to let the, the user know or the talent know what it is you want them to do. And if the ask is that we want you to become a lead or we want you to become an applicant, make that phone stupid easy for somebody to say, oh, I'm supposed to fill out this form. You got to make the form nice and easy, and you got to have it in a place that they can expect to find it every single every single moment of every single day. It's like have it near the search bar, have it near anything that's consistent in your navigation, so that they know what to do. And actually, the implementation of this persistent talent network has um, significantly driven um, growth in our 
talent network, and I think our talent network has grown 40% um, in the last two months. And then look at the, how your pages are performing. This is the last story I'll tell, and I'll make it pretty quick and anecdotal so that we can get to questions. Um, the third most visited page on the Smashfly career site is Perks. So that entertains me um, for many, many reasons. But going back to Catherine's statement, you are not your perks, and we most certainly are not <laughs> our perks. But it absolutely matters to our candidates. And I was shocked to see after job search and, and after the homepage, it was perks. I was like, well, OK, well, what do we do about that? And this is my moment of talking about continuous improvement, right? So when we found out that this was the third most visited page, we are like, holy moly, that's a missed opportunity. Because you know what's missing? Calls to action and stories. <laughs> so when you, when you roll over those buttons, there's no stories. It just gives you what that button is. So what we're going to be implementing with my dear friend, Ted, who I work with over here at Smashfly, um, who had the amazing idea to say, well, why don't we you mouse over that? It opens up and tells a story of an employee that is leveraging that perk. So guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be implementing stories that satisfy that person and tell the story of how those perks impact our people. Because people believe people. They don't believe brands. And then the other missing thing, and this embarrassed me epically as a marketer, that there's no call to action on this page to say, join our talent network. I mean, there's the persistence in the footer. But there should be a call out, call to action when you visit this page, maybe at the top and at the bottom, to say, you should learn more about our perks, join our talent network. So that was, that was one of my favorite uh, whoopsies uh, in my career so far at Smashfly. So that covers us for science. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. And I'm sorry we're a little long today. Thanks, Tracy. Um, thanks to all three of our speakers. Um, this is a great dialogue. Um, since we're a little short on time for Q&A, um, we're going to cover a couple. But then we're going to do a Q&A roundup on our blog where we're answer we are going to answer all the questions that we've gotten. So we will be sending out the link to the blog post as well with a follow-up email so that you can have access to that and make your question got answered. Um, so the first question I'm going to address kind of goes toward the art side, which is for passive candidates, how do you attract them to your site with employee videos? What are your recommendations for going beyond a job ad to attract target talent? Yeah, so I'll, I'll chime in. This is Catherine. Um, I think that there's a lot of different ways I've seen companies get really creative about getting out there. Because you're right, by the time somebody's already on your career page, they're at the very least in the consideration phase which means that there's so many people out there that are maybe not aware of your job, that haven't yet had their interest peaked. So there's a couple different ways I've seen. Um, obviously, there are a number of career and recruitment platforms out there, um, like the news, like the big classic, you know, LinkedIn, et cetera, which have populations of people who may not be thinking about your company as a destination yet, which can be a great place to uh, get your, your videos in front of them on another channel. I've seen companies um, do great jobs by contributing content occasionally. So having you, one of your employees, one of your leaders uh, write an article for um, either LinkedIn influencers uh, for an online publication about something about your culture or problems you're tackling. Again, that can be a great way to get out in front of uh, of other channels, and then social media. Not only your official social media channels, but your employees' social channels. Each of them is connected to networks that you don't have access to, which can be a great way to encourage them to share content that's been created, to share their stories, um, and to really help uh, spread the work. I, can't, I couldn't agree with that more. Employee amplification, that's, that's one way. That's a good mm -hmm. way. Great. Thanks. Um, another question that we received says, a lot of people talk about being authentic and real. How do you actually start that if your employer brand isn't doing this already, and how do you shift to that authenticity? Talk to your employees. Uh, I, I mean, sitting down, for me, the greatest content that you can you can get, and I'm, I'm literally at GoDaddy's Sunnyvale HQ right now doing a video shoot where we're really, we put a camera in front of a candidate, or in front of an employee, and we, we have a conversation with them. We ask them to ask them to talk about from their unique perspective. I think when you really speak to your employees about, and get to the heart of what, what makes them come to, to work every day, you start getting really great, authentic content. I, I even prep them before they go on camera, before I talk to them, like, just be real with me. Like, don't don't give me a canned answer mm -hmm. that you we want to hear. Really, like, tell me about your best friend at work. Sometimes it's in the questions that you ask them to that makes them feel comfortable to be more authentic. Um, in you know, to just encourage employees to be real with you. And I think from them, you're going to get your most 
your most uh, authentic content. Yeah, another way that I've seen, um, so, you know, talking to your employees, having them describe it, you can also have other people who don't work with your company look at your career page, look at your social channel, and say, if you had to choose five adjectives, um, what do you think employees here are like? And it can be really eye-opening to see what they say. Are those the adjectives you're going for? Are they similar to the adjectives that people within the company would use to describe each other? Um, that can be a really illuminating exercise to understand if everybody's on the same page. That's great, yeah. I mean, that's part of what we do at Project Talent. We do uh, audits of people's employee rents so they can see externally from a third party, like, how's it coming off? So that's, that's a really good, really good tip. Great. Um, this question seems like it might be a little Tracy geared with the science side. Um, this one says, what's the single <laughs> most important thing to measure related to your career site? I have to pick one? All right, fine. Um, conversion. Conversion is the number one thing that you should be measuring. You made me pick. I had to pick. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, this is going to be the last question. Um, we're hitting the top of the hour. So this question says, what are your thoughts on using images that are not always necessarily in office or at their desk or non-traditional? I think we talked about that one a bit. Yeah, it, it really depends earlier. on your culture. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you to our speakers and thank you to all of our attendees. We had some great dialogue between the speakers and with the Q&A, and we definitely have a lot more questions that we can answer for you. So like I said, we'll get that up in a blog post and include that in the follow-up email. And so I'd like to tell everyone to have a great rest of their day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks well, thank you for so having me. For Thanks, everyone.